Here. And I'm delighted to share with you this morning. And today we continue our series that we started a couple of weeks ago, looking at the person and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives in the 21st century. Let's pray as we start. This is a few words from the prophet Jeremiah from the Lord through him. He says, thus says the Lord, let not a wise person boast of their wisdom and let not a powerful person boast of their power and let not a rich person boast of their riches but let the one who boasts boast in this that they understand and know me that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness justice and righteousness and I delight in these things and Lord some of us have known you a long time some of us just a short while and some of us coming to know you but we pray Lord that today by your spirit and through Jesus that we would all know you better and we thank you Lord Amen Kenneth Graham in Wind in the Willows has this line. He says, the clever men at Oxford know all that there is to be known, but they, none of them, know one half as much as intelligent Mr. Toad. (laughs) And the question for us today and the invitation for us today actually is, do we know God? How much of God do we know and how much would we like to know? The church at Colossae, uh, from our reading this morning, uh, the reading was addressed to them. They'd got themselves in a bit of a tangle. They had received the gospel that was preached to them. They'd trusted in Jesus. They'd given their life to him. They'd received the spirit. And they'd begun to live out and practice the Christian life. And Paul actually commends them. He says, you're you're marked by love. There's this love for one another and there's this love for their neighbors. And it's all good stuff. And they're keen to know more of God. They know that they've just got a snippet and that that just expands in their desire to know more of him. But the problem is that a kind of crosswind or a current or uh, an influence has come in that has sent them off on the wrong trajectory. And in their enthusiasm to know more of God, they followed a rather weird path. And they've gone all mystical into this kind of strange, esoteric, Gnostic, mystic labyrinth and it seems we're not sure exactly what's going on but they've moved away from Jesus at the center and the power of the spirit revealing the love of God the father to them and they're off on a kind of religious trip it's a sort of mishmash a a DIY thing and it's marked by religious days and religious duties and disciplines and special diets and these sort of strange ideas and secret knowledge and secret keys that they've got that others haven't it's all a bit weird all a bit religious this week I listened to a famous actress on the radio, uh, Radio 4, Women's Hour. I'm a big fan. <laughs> Best show on the radio. And uh, this actress, a wonderful actress, she says, I was brought up Catholic and I have a strong faith. I really do. But it's my faith and I've pieced it together. I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. What does that mean? What sort of pieces have you put in it? And then she went on and said, at a really difficult time in my life, she said, I used to do the ironing holding a crystal. I thought, oh, that's the sort of piece that you've brought into. Why not hold a banana? But you're holding a crystal. And she said, and I would go to bed with a crystal because that would somehow help me sleep better. A kind of DIY spirituality pieced together. Bit of the faith that she'd received and then some add-on 
extras that she kind of crafted. Bless her. Great actress. Not sure about her theology. But that's what's happening in the church at Colossae. They've received the apostolic faith has been delivered to them of God who saves us through his son, the eternal Logos made flesh who died for our sins on the cross and who's risen and ascended into glory and who sent his son, uh, his spirit to be with us. But they've moved away and they've bolted on some odd things. And Paul writes to steer them aright. And he affirms that there is more to know. And there is more to experience of God. And there are beautiful avenues and alleyways in this faith to explore. But the knowing comes by the Spirit. And that will always lead us to the Father and to the Son. Well, I got a few headings for us this morning. And first is this, that the Lord God, he's always wanted us to know him more. He's always wanted us to know him better. He's always wanted us to know him personally and intimately. That's a long sentence, more than the heading. Sorry about that. I was was off on one. (laughs) Knowing God is the presupposition of our existence. It's actually why we're here. It's why there is this planet that is configured in such a way to sustain human life. Because God in all eternity, desired and decreed that he might create a people in his image that he might be with them and love them and know them and be known by them. Knowing God is the grand narrative of the universe. It's why you're here. It's why we exist. And God has always wanted our company. God has always wanted to meet us, as it were, as he did with our first forefathers, Adam and Eve, in a paradise in the cool of the day. And from Genesis, the beginning of the Bible, to Revelation, the end of the Bible, there is this constant thread, writ large, that God is saying, don't be a stranger. God wants to be with us. The great catastrophe, sometimes called the fall, has caused the great misery of the ages. And rather than be content with knowing God, they wanted special knowledge. They wanted the, to know good and evil. And so they went against God's wishes and wills and command. And as the story tells us, ate of the forbidden fruit of the forbidden tree and, and all hell broke loose. And the worst of it was that that intimacy with God that God desired and designed was ruptured. And we know that in their shame, they hid from God. It's a familiar narrative and response. So often in our shame, we hide from God rather than move closer to get tidied up. And in their shame, hiding from God, God nevertheless comes. They hear him. They think he's coming angry. But he's coming in love and he's looking and seeking and calling them. And ever since the great catastrophe, there has been this attempt at a great recovery, preeminently through Jesus, where God moves towards us in love. And he chases us through the corridors of history, wanting to bring us back to himself. He is not a hidden or elusive God. He is not an unknown knower, as the philosophers say. He wills to be known. Not deus incognito, as some talk about him. Deus absconditus. I mean, why use Latin? Just to sound smart? Deus ex machina. No, he's the God who wills to be known and who preeminently reveals himself in flesh and blood in Jesus. God keeps his own counsel. But he doesn't want to keep his own company. And he's ever moving towards us in love. And as I've said, and I'll say it more in this sermon, preeminently he comes to us in Jesus, the eternal logos, the rationalizing principle of the universe, the one who speaks life into being. And he comes 
in our flesh that we might, as it were, behold him and beheld him. This revelation is recorded in our beautiful Bible. And here in the stories and the journeys and the descriptions and the propositions, we read about and we encounter that God. But it's never simply with the book that we have to do. It's with the reality behind the book. This beautiful book that I've given my life to teach. It's with the God revealed here. And God doesn't just dispatch doctrines. God sent his son, and then God sends his spirit. And revelation is encounter. It's a meeting with him. These Christians in the church at Colossae had met him, had understood God revealed in Jesus, God the Father revealed by the spirit. And they wanted more, but they'd gone off all a kilter. And sometimes we do. Or sometimes because of our sin, we withdraw and we retreat like Adam and Eve in our shame. But God presses on to reveal himself to us. And I want to say this morning, if you hear nothing else this morning, that God wants to meet with you. He wants you to know him more. He wants the most intimate encounter with him, not to be in your past, but to be in your present and in your future. As C.S. Lewis writes about about the, the waterfall, he talks about further up and further in, into him. In that great movie, Born Supremacy, which I must have seen 30 times, One of the CIA chiefs called Ward Abbott challenges another agent called Pamela Landy. You'll have seen the film, some of you. It's a great line. He says, you talk about this stuff, spycraft. You talk about this stuff as if you read it in a book. And God doesn't want us to just talk about him or sing about him or uh, engage with him as if we've read it in a book. This is the book of books. This is the book of life. Through this book, Jesus is revealed to us, but he comes to meet us personally by the action and agency of the Spirit. And the question is, do you know him? Do you know him? That's the first thing. Secondly, the Spirit makes the knowledge of God in Jesus personal. Knowing God is the great obsession of Paul's life. It's what he gave himself for and ultimately gave his life for. And for decades, he just preached all the way around Asia Minor and then pressed on into Europe, wanting to introduce people to God. Not just information, not just propositions, but a relationship with him made possible through Jesus. And in the letter to Philippians that was read to us, if you've got your Bible, do turn to Philippians 1. He'd planted these churches, in Philippians, we're in Colossians, in Philippians, he says at one point, it's towards the end of his life, he says, I want to know Christ. And you think, well, what are you on about, Paul? You know him. You planted the church here, you introduced us to him. But Paul knew that there was more to know. And in Colossians, he's writing to that church that he plays, saying, I want you to know him more. Paul wanted it for himself, and Paul wanted it for all the churches that he had oversight of, because he knew that there was always more. How can you capture Niagara Falls in an egg cup? I mean, you can't. But the knowledge of God is like that. But there's always more to be overwhelmed by. In what some think is his last letter in Timothy, he says this, I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. Not I know what. Do you know whom you have believed? That's what he's praying for these Christians in Colossae. And the difference between believing and knowing is experiencing. And that comes by the Spirit. Verse 9, Colossians chapter 1, he says, My unceasing prayer for you 
He keeps praying it because he knows there's more and he knows they haven't got it. My unceasing prayer for you is that you are filled with the knowledge of God's will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And then in verse 10, growing in the knowledge of God. And Paul's prayer is that they know God. And twice he uses a word that can be translated fully no, it's an interesting word. The word for knowledge in Greek, as many of you will know, is the word gnosis, from which we get our word diagnostic and diagnosis and gnostic, but not gnu. Um, <laughs> knowledge. But the word that he uses, and it's an unusual word that's found mainly on his, in his letters, is the word epignosis. And putting epi there beefs it up somewhat. Adding this epi to the gnosis, someone has said, is like an arrow that carries the knower direct to the object known. It's an intensifier. It's a kind of fan-assisted oven <laughs> or a turbocharger on the car. One scholar wrote, it's participation by the knower in the object known. I want you to fully know I want you to come to this full knowledge, not just information, not just these propositions for discussion, but something fully known and owned. It's a truth that becomes metabolized in us and becomes part of us and real to us. It's an ingressive knowledge. It's a knowledge that gets on the inside. It's participation in that, the one that we know. Twice Paul refers to this full knowing in that little passage. Twice he alludes to the work of the Spirit as the one who does this. He talks about being filled with this knowledge. It comes from outside us, the agency and the action of the Spirit. Whenever Paul talks about being filled, invariably it's to do with the work of God's Spirit. And then he talks about wisdom and understanding. It's a beautiful little couplet we find in Isaiah 14, which talks about the work of the Spirit on the Messiah. Wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and fear of the Lord, and his delight will be in the fear of the Lord. And Paul is alluding to that. And he's saying it's the Spirit that fills us, that gives us this full knowledge of wisdom and understanding to fully know Him. Knowing God comes from without, and it comes then within. It's the agency of the Spirit. If God is a person, then propositions and doctrines and descriptions are only going to get us so far however accurate they are, however sublime they are. I've spent decades reading doctrine. I love it, but I want to know the reality behind the sentence, behind the proposition. And this book was never meant simply to give us information, although it is that this beautiful Bible is there to introduce us to an encounter with the one it celebrates. And only God can reveal God. And who knows the Father better than the Spirit? And who knows the Son better than the Spirit? And the Spirit is sent as a go-between God to lead us into all truth and knowing of the Lord. And then thirdly, you can see it's the same point. I'm just making it in different ways. There's always more to know about God. When was the last time you met him? When was the last time you encountered him? When was the last time you were mind blown by what he revealed of himself to you? When was the last time you experienced his love and his power coursing through you and using you? In the 17th century, a great, one of the world's great intellectuals, Blaise Pascal, he was a polymath. He contributed at the highest level to mathematics, to physics, to philosophy, even to design, product design, he invented the first calculator. And he always believed in God. He believed the creeds. He said them. He said yes to what the book said. And then one day he met him. And 
And after his death, they found on a piece of parchment sewn into a doublet. He wore a waistcoat and, uh, and sewn into it. Over his, in the lining, over his heart was a testimony, a record, a witness to his encounter with God. And it, here's a bit of it. It says this, Monday the 23rd. When you meet him, you never forget where you were, how you were, and when it was. Monday the 23rd, 10.30, he says, half past 10 until half past midnight, fire. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, i.e. the one we read about, not of the philosophers or of the learned, certitude, certitude, feeling, joy, peace. This is the smartest man on the planet at the time. His words are just trying to tumble out to make sense of this experience. Then he says, God of Jesus Christ, my God and your God, your God will be my God. He is only found by the ways taught in the gospel, grandeur of the human soul, that God would deign to come and live with him. Righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I've known you. Joy, 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 joy. Tears of joy. He never recovered from that event. Went on to write some remarkable things, published later as the Ponces. An encounter with God. God wants us to know him. God's longing to meet with us. Still happening today. People meeting Jesus and going deeper. What about Professor Alistair McGrath? Many of you will have heard of him, you may have read his books. He published over 50 works, often at the interface of science and religion. He, he converted the Christ when he was 16 in Northern Ireland. And then he came up to Oxford and he realized that he wanted to know more. And one day he says this, he said, I cycled out to Witham Woods or Whiteham Woods. And I found a place to sit on a hillock from which I could see Oxford's dreaming spires. And having asked God to help me, I opened my Bible and began to read from Philippians, quote, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ my Lord. And as I read and reread those words, I began to realize the true nature of my problem. My faith had affected my mind but left the rest of me untouched. Up to that point, I had thought of spiritual growth in terms of accumulating knowledge. And so I had read commentaries and books, but that hadn't deepened the quality of my faith. I was like someone that read books about France, but never visited it. Or someone who had read about falling in love, but never visited experienced it and you can spend your life reading the bible and never know the one who it speaks about testifies about and describes and invites you into a relationship with there's a lot of that out there McGrath goes on and says what spoke to me powerfully that morning was Paul's distinction between knowing about Jesus and knowing him he says, many of you will know this is blindingly obvious, but it took me a while to discover it. He joined this church and then was mentored by the great Michael Green, a former rector, now with the Lord. And he said this, it is a duty and a joy for all Christians to experience God to the full. That's what we're talking about. Well, let me conclude. God revealed in Jesus the story recorded in this revelation in this beautiful Bible wants you to know him. And you can know him. There may be some here watching online or sat here in this church. You've never really met him. You've heard about him. You may even believe in him, his historicity and even his divinity, but you've never met him and you've never entered into a relationship with him. Today you can. You just say, yes, come into my life. 
Others of you have been Christians for just a short while and you're all excited by that. Listen, there is still more to know. And some of you here, you've been Christians for years and may, you've been faithful and dutiful, but maybe you're weary. And the Lord wants to refresh that relationship with you and to reveal himself more to you and to give himself more to you, to reveal Jesus to you, to pour the Father's love upon you and to fill you with his spirit. Stephen, our rector, asked me this week, he said, what's the greatest difference knowing God makes? I actually wrote loads of stuff and then I deleted it because it just seemed pathetic. Did you, see the, did you see the sky last Sunday night in Oxford? It was fire. It was just blazing red and pink. It was awesome. And in the middle of it, over Oxford, was a rainbow. I'm reduced to metaphors when it comes to describing what God's love is like and knowing him. But it's like being put in that fire, as Pascal said, and that rainbow of beauty and grace put over us. And actually, words do run out, and we're left speechless and open-mouthed in wonder. Last week, we baptized a student here, his testimony was fantastic. Seven months ago, he said he was an aggressive atheist of the Dawkins mold. And he, but he came from a Hindu background, but he'd rejected the faith of his forefathers. And he came to all dates and he thought, he said, what is this, a soft rock concert? <laughs> and then he said, why am I crying? And every time he came, he'd cry. Couldn't work it out. So he attended an Alpha course. He came there just to argue, he thought, but to explore a bit. And at the end of the course, he had heard about and believed in Jesus as God's son, and he gave his life to him. And here we were baptizing him. You know, knowledge of God doesn't stop at Alpha. Doesn't stop at the Alpha course. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. There's another 23. And we want to go further up and further in. And it's knowledge of God the Father. And it's knowledge of God the Son in Jesus. And it comes by the Spirit as we study this word and as we open ourselves and ask him to fill us. Amen. Let's stand and we're going to worship.